All right, Sasha Polikov Suransky is with us now. As we said, the man who uncovered these documents, also a senior editor uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Thank you for your time, sir. I've been going through the documents which you've had, the, the articles which have been written. It seems there were negotiations for sure. We see that. Tell me exactly what. Is it actual nuclear material that was going to come from Israel or was it uh, know-how, knowledge, advice? Which one was it? Well, what these specific documents confirm is that there were high-level discussions between the two defense ministers in March and April 1975. Now, the know-how was not necessarily being discussed at this point. The topic of these meetings was Jericho missiles. And Shimon Peres has now denied that he ever made an explicit offer. However, what's clear from reading these documents and subsequent South African documents that were written later that day and in the following days is that the South Africans perceived that there was a nuclear offer on the table. They so, okay, uh, let me stop, let me stop you there. Just, I'm, I'm sorry, the there's, a, there's a satellite delay here. That's, that's yeah. what I wanted to ask you about, this correct payload. There is a, a, a Jericho okay. missile. A Jericho missile. Is that a, a nuclear-capable missile or is it a specific nuclear weapon? Just to be very clear. It's a missile that can carry a nuclear warhead. Okay, so those were on the table, and we've got General Armstrong, the South African Lieutenant General Armstrong, saying we need the correct payload. That's a quote, correct payload. And Shimon Perez says in return, well, we've got three different sizes. What does that mean then? Well, it's a bit ambiguous, and there are various different interpretations of that, but the way that the South Africans interpreted, which is clear from Armstrong's memo that was written later that day on March 31st, is that the South Africans were only interested in one kind of payload. They were interested in nuclear warheads, and Armstrong wrote a memo to his superiors in the South African Defense Force that day arguing that nuclear weapons would be beneficial for South Africa, it would enhance South Africa's defense strategy. And if you look at later documents that I also have in my possession from as as late as 1979, the South Africans were only interested in these Jericho missiles if they carried a nuclear warhead. And South Africans were actually invited to watch tests of the Jericho in Israel in 1979. And after watching those tests, wrote back to their superiors in Pretoria and said, this would be very beneficial for us, but only if it carried a nuclear warhead. So in subsequent years, it's also clear what the South Africans were interested in and how they interpreted Perez's offer. So is there actually to, to coin a phrase, a smoking gun that we can see here. You've said that the South Africans believed that this was on the table, the idea of a nuclear warhead was on the table. Is there the definitive thing which says a nuclear weapon was going to be sold to South Africa if this plan had gone through? There is not a smoking gun in the sense that you just laid out. What there is is evidence that this was discussed at the very highest level between two defense ministers and that the issue of nuclear weapons was broached and that the South Africans believed it was on the table. The deal didn't go through, as the Guardian story noted, and as my forthcoming book, The Unspoken Alliance, details. However, in subsequent years, the South Africans and the Israelis cooperated on building more advanced versions of the Jericho and testing them in South Africa. And that lasted well into the 1980s, almost until 1990. All the documents you have, and correct me if I'm wrong, they're from the South African side. The reason I ask you, I'm wondering if there's anything from the Israeli side. Shimon Peres has come out and said there is no Israeli document and there is no Israeli signature on any document. Now, some of the documents I've seen, there does appear to be a signature of Shimon Peres on that. So there's some sort of disconnect there. But is this all coming from the South African side? Uh, yes, the documents are coming from the South African side. However, the South Africans kept very good records, and that included all of their correspondence with the Israelis. So when you go through the South African archive, you'll actually see many documents with Israeli signatures on them. And I have one of them here with me, which has Shimon Peres's signature on it, uh, which I can show the camera. This was published or signed f four days after the Armstrong Memorandum on March 31st, dated April 3rd, 1975. The signatures on this document are Shimon Peres, Defense Minister of Israel, P.W. Bota, Defense Minister of South Africa. However, I should note that this document is a secrecy agreement 
and it essentially binds both parties to uh, maintaining the secrecy of all of their relations regarding conventional weapons, nuclear weapons, anything else. So Perez's signature is on this. Perez's signature is not on the minutes from the meetings he attended four days earlier. However, those minutes confirm that Perez was discussing the possibility of nuclear warheads. Right. So technically speaking, I'm going to just, for your sake and for the viewer's sake, I'm going to read this out again, the release from uh, the president's office, Shimon Perez. Israel has never negotiated the exchange of nuclear weapons with South Africa. Yeah. There exists no Israeli document or Israeli signature on a document that such negotiations took place. So he's actually saying what he's saying is technically true because the documents you've seen a signature on are talking about a secrecy agreement, not negotiations. Correct, Kamal. And, 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 you know, Perez is a politician. He's the president of Israel now, and he is speaking as a politician and somewhat predictably uh, weaseling his way out of this situation. I, I think if you look at all of these documents together and piece them together, as journalists have and as I have in, in my Ph.D. dissertation and, and in my book, it's very clear that the South Africans would not have written a memorandum about nuclear weapons and their benefits for South African defense strategy on the same day as a meeting with Mr. Perez if this offer had not been discussed during the meeting. So when you connect the dots, it's quite clear what was going on. Uh, I'd also like to add a point, a historical point that I think is significant here and that your viewers should understand is, is that Shimon Perez has a long history of conducting his own freelance foreign policy. If you look at the history of Israel's relationship with France during the 1950s, and this was how Israel attained its initial nuclear capability, was with the aid of the French, Shimon Peres was a mid-level defense ministry functionary during mm -hmm. those years, and he conducted his own foreign policy behind the back of the foreign ministry, and he angered a lot of the senior Israeli leaders, including Golda Meir, who, okay. was, who was foreign minister during some of those years. So it, it's entirely probable that Peres was operating in the same way here and that he did not have the approval of Prime Minister Rabin when he conducted these discussions with the South African Defense Minister. And that may also explain why the deal never went through in addition to the South Africans balking at the high cost. Because you have to remember the South Africans were also initiating their own nuclear research and development program at that point. They didn't gain nuclear weapons until the 1980s, the early 1980s. However, they were also thinking at this point of developing it on their own, which may also explain why this deal never went through. Okay, quickly, Sasha, bottom line, does all of this just make a mockery of the nuclear ambiguity which Israel has always held? We've spoken to guests earlier today who have said, look, once Shimon Perez has said, has this never happened with South Africa? And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying anything more about our nuclear status. Well, look, this has been known for a long time. Israel's nuclear capability was known to the American intelligence community by the late 1960s, and the rest of the world found out of it, about it from Mordechai Venunu in 1986, when he published photographs from inside Dimona. So this is not really uh, a secret. Uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, the worst kept secret, as Avner Cohen, uh, an expert on the nuclear program in Israel, would say, and, and has written a book about. So uh, in that sense, it's not news. This is, this is old news. However, the, the new story here is that this was discussed at a very, very high level with the South Africans in 1975 at a time when South Africa was, as your earlier guest said, seeking a nuclear capability. And as I mentioned earlier, the two countries continued to cooperate well into the 1980s on South Africa's nuclear-capable missile program. And the Israelis were very, very important in that effort because they had much more expertise in the field of rocketry and delivery systems and helped the South Africans a great deal with that during the mid-1980s. Sasha Polakov-Saransky joining us live from New York. It's been great talking to you. Thank you for your time.